Arduino boards were bought and all people did was blink LEDs, LEDs, and that was it. And the reason for it was uh, just the language was too hard, right? And they stopped doing it. So it's nice to see things like MicroPython and Tobias is going to talk about it on a different board. Uh, all right. So uh, thank you very much, Tobias. Looking forward to it. So, uh, yes, we uh, just had a talk earlier on uh, CircuitPython, which is uh, kind of the same thing uh, like MicroPython. Um, I'm going to talk about MicroPython and its particular use uh, on the RP2040 uh, microcontroller. Um, uh, but, yeah, first of all, I would like to th thank the organizers for... Uh, giving me the opportunity to present this talk and of to organizing this wonderful event. So thank you. And uh, now uh, something about the, uh, the outline of my talk. So I will start to talk a short introduction about the company, then on MicroPython, so uh, that we have just seen a bit before, then the RP2040 microcontroller, and then I'll start showing some examples how you can leverage uh, MicroPython to um, uh, access these various features of this microcontroller. And at ver uh, towards the end, we will, uh, I will show some other example and uh, discuss when uh, MicroPython could be maybe uh, not the most uh, best choice to uh, run programs on this uh, microcontroller. And then there is time for some discussions. So, about Jigsaw, um, it's a company I founded uh, about a year ago. Uh, we're operating from Lausanne, Switzerland, and our aim is to provide custom IT solutions based on open source hardware and software. So, in, in, if ever you need some help on something, don't hesitate to call us and uh, be always open for discussions. Um, so, about MicroPython. <coughs> It is a, a, an implementation of the Python 3 uh, programming language. Uh, it is uh, designed, and also the, the standard library of Python, or at least a subset of it. It was uh, initiated by Damian George, uh, who open sourced this project in uh, 2013, after he launched a successful Kickstarter campaign where he proposed a a small microcontroller board that was uh, based on a STM32 and was called the Pi board is actually an excellent hardware and uh, useful for many things. And so, uh, in between, uh, since then, uh, MicroPython has been uh, ported to many, many different uh, microcontroller architectures. It is a really active community. Um, the last release day, uh, it's version 1.19, and it is from this summer. And it's really a, a great playground to, to use uh, and play with microcontrollers, as you will see later. Um, the RP2040 uh, is, a, is a microcontroller. Uh, it got famous not only because it made it on the famous batch of the DEF CON uh, this year, but also because it is the first silicon that is uh, developed by Raspberry Pi, which I believe everybody knows. And <laughs> these uh, products are always, uh, um, there are a lot of trade-offs to be done. And as you, I hope I convince, can convince you is that they really rolled out a, a microcontroller that is uh, low cost, that is fast, innovating, and so it's really a nice thing to play with. Um, regarding the architecture, um, it is a dual-core ARM Cortex-M0 Plus processor. It has 264 kilobytes uh, SRAM on chip. The uh, flash uh, memory is external. Uh, maximum size is 16 megabytes, and is connected to the controller via QSPI bus. It has a very capable DMA controller, uh, everything is connected over a crossbar, so you can, it, makes it makes it very flexible. You can move data from one part to the other very easily. And uh, there are on-chip programmable L uh, vol uh, voltage regulators and PLLs, for, uh, uh, for example. 
supplying the, the, the circuit with uh, the core voltage of 1.1 volt. And there are also accelerated uh, fluid in integer and uh, floating point libraries on the chip. Um, regarding the peripherals, so uh, as many, all the microcontrollers, there are some standard um, uh, interfaces like uh, UART, SPI controllers, I squared C controllers, 16 uh, pulse width modulation channels. There is a USB uh, 1.1 controller and fee uh, with host and device support, so that allows you to easily connect it to some, uh, some PC and uh, just load the firmware, drop the firmware on the on the file system that appears and then you run. Uh, it's, really, it's really very easy and trivial to use. There are uh, 30 GPIO, GPIO pins, of which four can be used as analog inputs, and there is an onboard temperature sensor. Um, now Raspberry Pi, they not only uh, uh, um, um, sell the silicon, but also uh, they uh, released a couple of ports that can be shown on this slide. So there is a, a basic version, uh, a one with a header, and the, the latest one has a Wi-Fi module. And so uh, the, the, they are very cheap. Huh? The, the basic version is about four, even less than four francs. So everybody can afford uh, to buy one of those and play with them. Um, so now, uh, Regarding the development, um, obviously every major uh, Python IDE has their MicroPython plugin. Uh, in the, uh, the, the Raspberry Pi, they, they officially uh, mention at least the Sony IDE in their documentation. It's something I didn't know before, but actually turned out to be really, really easy to use. And it has absolute great support for the, the Pico hardware. So um, if you just want to play with such a board, it's really easy. You just install this, this IDE. And then installing the firmware is as simple as uh, clicking on a button in the, in the options, um, options and interpreter sub-menu. Here, um, a first primer on things. Uh, of course, microcontrollers aren't funny if you don't have two pins to, to play with. So uh, you always have this. Uh, I hope you can read the, the, the text. Oops. Um, oops. Wrong direction. Um, you always have this module uh, machine where you can uh, import some uh, classes that represent your hardware. Um, then, uh, for example, here we, we see you, we, the, the LED of the, of the Pico is connected to pin 25, so you uh, instantiate an object, you tell it what pin to use, uh, the function of the pin, maybe a value, and then you can set uh, trivially uh, the, the level of the pin. If you want an input, well, you do more or less the same thing. You tell it a pin, you tell it a function. You, there are some other options, like if you want to pull up uh, the, the input to, with, uh, to, to VCC or to ground, or to pull down to ground, and then you can just uh, read the value. Or uh, Then, uh, obviously, uh, your pins, the input pins, they will change to levels. Uh, Putting an interrupt handler on the pin is uh, very trivial. It's just a bit, uh, you just need to take care because, because obviously um, interrupt handlers need to be fast and there are some restrictions like uh, you, should, you cannot allocate heap uh, memory in the interrupt handler, for example. Um, so here we see we just uh, call this interrupt function. We put, uh, we, we give it the, 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 the handle routine to execute when the level changes, for example, if you have a falling edge or a rising edge or a, a special level. And then uh, it will just call the callback function if the, when the interrupt uh, occurs. Um, regarding the ADC, uh, 
Again, you uh, just give it the pin and then you can read the value from one of the ADP channels. Uh, pulse width modulation, uh, same thing. Uh, <coughs> I put some functions regarding uh, if you want to do delays or uh, uh, tick functions if you want to uh, time some routines or uh, uh, here it is important to use the helper functions that come uh, with time because uh, these tick functions are very, uh, the values they return are really dependent on the port that is used and therefore you should always use the helper functions to deal with them. On the RP2040 port, um, the timers are actual logical timers so you can do as many as you want. They all use the same uh, global microsecond uh, um, time base, and uh, so you can use these to, to run uh, callback functions periodically. Um, <coughs> now, uh, uh, the machine module also has this uh, fre frequency function where you can read the clock system clock frequency and you can set it. So uh, you might want, for example, uh, people sometimes want to uh, reduce the co power consumption of the microcontroller, and for that they will try to, to um, uh, lower the frequency as long as they have enough processing power. And other people want uh, more processing power and they will just increase it. Uh, you can easily uh, adjust dynamically the, the, the system clock uh, to something like 270 megahertz. Um, just by calling this frequency function, if you go above, your uh, Pico or RP2040 will crash and you will have to power cycle it to uh, make it uh, alive again. And this is because the, the memory chip is just too slow to handle. And, uh, but people did overclocking of more than 400 megahertz but it re requires that you tweak the, uh, on one hand uh, the voltage, um, on the core voltage, and on the other hand you need to throttle the, the QSPI clock that your memory still can follow. Um, yeah. Now, um, uh, <coughs> There are two cores on the on the on the RP2040. Um, usually, if you use micro Python, you use one core uh, running on, on core zero. Uh, but for some occasions, it can be useful uh, to use the second core. Um, it is done in a way that, uh, well, uh, you have uh, all the all the subsystems in the microcontroller. And you have both cores that uh, access these uh, resources uh, concurrently. I mean, your cores run concurrently, and therefore you need really to take care, take care of when you uh, access the resources and use uh, locking primitives to avoid that you write to the same uh, variable, for example, uh, from both cores. Um, there is absolutely no GIL and uh, global interpreter lock. Uh, they really, the processes just run. And, and uh, an example is shown here. So uh, what you do is, for if you want to use the second core, is you just import a thread module, and then you have a, a function that call, is called the start new thread. You give it the function to run and the arguments, and then it will go on the second core. And then um, it's up to you to ensure that they, it plays nicely with the, the first core. Um, Obviously, you can just run one uh, process uh, at a time on core one. Uh, I didn't find a way how to figure out if there is already uh, uh, a process still running. Um, but in that case, I mean, you either make a thread that uh, lives the, during the whole life of your main program and you uh, manage to synchronize both threads uh, accordingly, or you can also just try to uh, launch a new thread, and if uh, if there is all, uh, still a thread running, well, you just get an exemption, and then you you have to deal with that. Um, 
Another way that uh, could be very interesting, that sounds might be interesting, is for example, uh, since you have a second core that maybe you don't even uh, uh, thought of using, is that uh, you can have uh, use a second core to to run an async uh, an event loop for uh, asynchronous uh, programming, for example. So. You could imagine that you have a huge program that you already written and that is sequential code and you run it on one core. And then you want to uh, fancy you up your program with some asynchronous code. And that can be done by putting the asynchronous code on the, the second core, for example. Uh, I put, a, I made a small example here that is nothing useful, but it's just for demonstration. So uh, we have a first core routine that just flashes uh, the LED for uh, for some time and prints some output. Um, a second uh, core routine that does something completely different. We have this small function here that represents your big sequential program uh, that from time to time uh, calls a core routine like here. And then you have the main coroutine that gets everything uh, up running. And so you can, uh, in this case, for example, uh, your uh, other function, it will run on core one, and the event loop will run on core zero. And so whatever you uh, run, uh, coroutine you run, it will run on core uh, zero and the sequential code is on code one. So maybe it's useful. I thought it's a nice exercise. So. Um, um, now, <coughs> um, this uh, RP2040 uh, comes with, uh, with uh, a feature that I did not know before. It's called the programmable in out. And uh, uh, it's actually, it's uh, two blocks with four state machines each. And these uh, state machines, uh, you can look at them like uh, coprocessors that are really dedicated to in input and output. So these are very simple state machines. They cannot do a lot of things, but the things they can do, uh, they are very deterministic. So you know exactly your timing. You can tweak the timing of each uh, um, uh, a loop inside or of your function, and then uh, it allows you to uh, and yeah, it's really it's 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 really independent processors and 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 it's really a nice feature. So this case added to all the other peripherals, and so if for example you need uh, eight UARTs, for example, you can use the state machines to make uh, eight UARTs or uh, at least for one direction or. Um, uh, lots of different uh, just in input output. So the the graph here is from uh, from the the data sheet of RP twenty forty, and you see that each state machine is uh, is uh, connected to the rest of the microcontrollers through uh, four uh, deep uh, FIFOs, uh, one for receiving and one for uh, sending, and then there is the GPIO uh, mapping to connected to the pins. Um, so each state machine is equipped with uh, two 32-bit uh, shift registers, the input shift register, the output shift register. They have two scratch registers, X and Y. Um, they have um, uh, the FIFOs that we talked before uh, that are uh, DMA capable. And uh, the FIFOs uh, can if you just use one direction, you can combine the two FIFOs to a, a eight deep uh, FIFO. Um, they have a fractional clock divider that defines how fast your program runs compared to the uh, system clock frequency, and the IR, uh, the interrupt flag that can either be used uh, locally to synchronize different state machines between each other, or you can also propagate interrupts to the to the system. Uh, there is a flexible GPIO mapping, so um, uh, and the one special thing is that uh, the four state machines in the block they uh, share the same instruction memory. Now the 
your GP, uh, PIO program and uh, your definition, what uh, pins are used, are detached, which means that you can uh, use the uh, you can run the same program on uh, four different state machines. They do all the thing, same thing, but with different um, with different uh, pins. And and uh, but or you have uh, four different things to do, and then you just need to split off the the memory. Um, <laughs> the the PIO uh, these state machines they understand nine instructions: uh, jump, wait. Uh, I mean the the names are I think they talk to for themselves. In out. Push pull is for uh, uh, exchanging the data over the FIFOs. Move, uh, interrupt, and set. Um, the, there is one instruction per cycle. Um, there is no arithmetic, so you cannot do add or, and things like that. You can just, in the move uh, command, you can do in place some uh, bit reversing or uh, calculate the bitwise complement. And um, the fun, nice thing about MicroPython is that um, there is an RP2 module where you can all this PIO uh, in line, which I think it's much more convenient than if you use the C, C++ SDK of, uh, or, uh, for the uh, RP2040 and have separate fails and things. Here you just uh, have it in the same program and here I show a, a, an example where I run about the simplest function you can run on, on such state machine. It's an, just a not, a not gate. So uh, we import this famous RP2 uh, module. Um, we uh, define the, the program uh, for the not gate. So we use this instruction jump pin, which will jump as long as your pin is at the high level. And so if it's high, we, we, we set it to low. If it's low, we set it to high. Uh, the wrap instructions are uh, not necessary because by default, the state machine wraps over uh, at the end of the program to the beginning, and which doesn't need a cycle, for, uh, uh, by the way. And then you instantiate your, your uh, state machine. So you uh, we define a pin. For input, output, uh, we, def as, uh, we uh, assign it to a state machine. Here, the program, we run it at the maximum or the standard uh, clock frequency. And we define the pin sets for set, so to put the level on the output pin, and for the jump. And we activate it, and then we see here the result. We see the so the yellow trace is uh, the, just some uh, signal generator uh, at the input. The, the pink one is the, uh, the output. Uh, there is a delay of something like uh, 40 milli uh, nanoseconds between the input and the output. Uh, here I tried just to shave off another 10 um, nano, uh, nanoseconds by switching off a feature that's called the input synchronizer which uh, avoids uh, that there are some instabilities at the input. But anyway, so it's, it's not as fast as a, a, a single gate, but anyway, it's fast enough for plenty of things. And uh, it just demonstrates how you can use such a uh, uh, state machine just independently of what you're running on, <laughs> on your main processors. Um, then, when after having the not gate, well, you can do other things. <laughs> Here are examples for. Um, I just checked the time. Um, uh, other ex sorry uh, uh, for other uh, uh, gate uh, logic functions. Here, for example, uh, an AND gate. And uh, here, here I use another feature, which is called the side set. So we see these instructions side one, and this is something they introduced where you can, uh, next to the main pin set, you can define another set, a side set of pins, where you can, for example, generate um, a clock 
for a, if you have a synchronized bus and you need the clock signal, you can use the side set to do that. And, um, and so here, for this example, I just use it to, to define the output of the NAND and the end at the same time. Uh, again, uh, this is just standard. You initiate your state machine, uh, you, you define the pin sets, and then off you go. And uh, here is another example for an OR, an XOR. And finally, for, since it's really a generic processor, uh, well, here you don't care if you have two inputs or 25 inputs, you just, uh, it's all the same. Um, um, <coughs> now, before we come to the, to another example, there um, is also uh, one thing that, uh, the speaker before mentioned is that it's not always uh, easy to get uh, things uh, merged into the, the micro Python. Um, and for example, uh, the, the RP2040 has a very capable DMA controller. It has two uh, independent DMA channels. It is, uh, uh, so it's capable to do one read and one write access of up to 30 bits, 32 bits per cycle. Um, it is very flexible. You can use, uh, for example, you can chain DMA, DMA operations or you can use a DMA operation to configure another subsequent DMA operation. And everything of that runs in, uh, in parallel to your uh, processor course. And, and so you don't need to, once you configure them, uh, well, it just runs. And, and, uh, but there is no support for that in MicroPython. Now there, there was a guy that, that made a pull request with some uh, helper functions and stuff like that, um, but it didn't get merged into MicroPython. And, and, and so uh, what do you do then? Uh, do you just forget about it or go to the C++ or C++, uh, C++ SDK? Well, no, you're not up. You don't need to. You, can, you have always this, this tool that's called the UC types where you can define a, a, a dictionary uh, of your memory map, and and there too you define, the, for example, the the names of the registers uh, as the key of the dictionary. The value is uh, is the the offset and the data type, uh, or the the position of the bit fields and the length, and then you inst instantiate uh, a specific structure at a given memory address using UC type struct. And then you can access these uh, low-level register values just by writing into it. Uh, so you can anyway, if you don't have nice high-level functions, you can anyway uh, use all uh, whatever there is, and 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 uh, even if it's not really nice to read, and uh, but you still can use it. So uh, now another example. Um, I suppose you all heard of uh, the shortage in the semiconductor industry that we uh, had to deal with for the last couple of years. Um, well, before we even, especially if you designed a prototype, uh, we were used to have an infinite amount of uh, integrated circuits available. You just designed your stuff and uh, you ordered your parts and uh, you were happy. Uh, this has quite changed, so now everybody paranoically uh, has opened on the web browser all the uh, favorite uh, distributors, and you do you do uh, your design and you order the parts at the same time because because you don't know if in two days uh, the parts will still be available or if it's, a, it's saying back ordered you get it in one year. What do you then? Uh, well. Maybe you can wait. Ooh, okay, thank you. Uh, so, either you wait or you find another solution, maybe some shady uh, this uh, site on the internet and you don't know what you get, or you try to uh, make your uh, own. And so that's what we tried here. So uh, there was this uh, part called the LTC 2644, which is a, 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 an analog, a, pulse width modulation to analog converter, so you put it a pulse width modulation signal and you get out the, uh, an analog voltage. 
and obviously it was out of stock when I needed it. So I thought I could do it with the RP2040 and the DAC. Uh, so the, the, the schematic is very simple. You put, in my case, it was an inverted PVM, uh, WVM signal. Then you uh, count, you use a counter to uh, determine the pulse width, and then you uh, send it to, uh, over SPA to a DAC, and uh, you get the voltage out. Uh, the implementation, well, it's uh, nothing special, a, a bit like before. Uh, so it's just really, we just count. There is a, a, a loop with uh, takes two, sec uh, two uh, cycles and that uh, decrements uh, during the low level of the pulse. And then uh, we push the value out uh, to the main uh, code that gets the value. Uh, put it in a in a uh, in a structure and then uh, send it over the SPI bus and uh, well it works um, so you can see here uh, the 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 pink line is a uh, is a chirp uh, pulse width modulation signal the blue line is uh, we see the staircase that is uh, realized by the the dark. And uh, well, if you measure the, the settling time, it's a bit slower than the, of the LTC 2644. But anyway, it's, uh, there's no optimizations and they're all, so I think you could shave off quite a bit of that from by uh, Andrew doing tweaking some stuff. And, and yeah, so it's another example where you can just use this, uh, this great microcontroller and the uh, realize a very specific functionality. Um, now, the last words, uh, when should you use C++ or C or Rust, uh, if you like, and when you should use MicroPython. So my opinion is that you should use whatever you're comfortable with. Um, there are some situations, for example, if you're really short on RAM or need very efficient uh, processing, that it might be useful to go to C++ or C++. On the other hand, there are tons of tools inside MicroPython that will allow you to speed up locally things. There is a native code emitter, if you want, uh, that produces machine instructions. There is a Viper code emitter that has further optimizations, uh, especially useful when you have uh, integer arithmetic or bit manipulations. You can use string interning, for example, uh, where you write your strings into the flash but it reads a recompilation of the firmware. And of course, there are uh, third-party modules available, like the ULAB, that is a NumPi-like uh, array manipulation, or you always can write your C or C++ modules when, if you need it. So, um, as a summary, um, I hope I could convince you that the RP2040 is a really interesting microcontroller and it's worth playing with. Um, MicroPython, on the other hand, is a very neat way to get fast on track and uh, play with these features. And if you're interested, so there is tons of projects on the web uh, uh, where people do quite advanced things like logic analyzers, oscilloscopes with the RP2040. So thank you for your attention. Uh, do you have questions? Thank you very much, Tobias.